Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Aditi Chaturvedi. Today, I will be presenting my thesis topic, which is the detection and comparison of parathyroid hormone levels with the pedontal status in pregnant females. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank my parents, this presentation, this thesis, and my career, which is I'm this dedicated to my, and my guru and uh, my mentors who have helped me with this research project, the head of the department, Dr. Amit Bharatwaj, Dr. Vidushi Shokan, and Dr. Jayati Nath, ma'am. And sir, thank you so much for all your help. So this is the topic of discussion today. That is uh, the detection and comparison of parathyroid hormone level with the pedontal status of pregnant females, a longitudinal study. This is the name of my thesis. So in this presentation, we will be discussing about an introduction, the aim and objective of my study, materials methods which were used, the results, conclusion, and the research article publications that have been published after the study. So research indicates that gum disease in pregnancy can lead to adverse outcomes such as low birth weight in uh, babies and premature births. During pregnancy, it is extremely important to undergo an oral health examination. Oral examination during pregnancy can prevent several adverse outcomes. Patients suffering from primary hyperparathyroidism show positive correlation between the serum pedontal hormone levels and the pedontal ligament space. There is an evidence of increased cortical bone density and the presence of tori and the evidence of destructive pedontal disease. There is a lack of emphasis on the perinatal oral health in India, with current initiatives focusing mainly on the postnatal period, particularly the early interventions for children. Due to limited access to public dental services and high cost of dental treatments leads to further detriment of women from the socioeconomic backgrounds, which are from a lower socioeconomic background. So this particular research study had been designed in order to detect and compare the levels of parathyroid hormone and the pedontal status observed in pregnant females during the complete duration of their pregnancy. There is a questionnaire which was designed in order to evaluate their oral health awareness, practices and knowledge. No earlier work had been done to compare the parathyroid hormone level on the status of pregnant females. So therefore, there was a lacuna which existed in the literature and this study was done in order to bridge that gap. So the aim of my study is to detect and was to detect the to detect and compare the parathyroid hormone level and its association with the pregnant uh, with the pregnant females. The objectives of my study were to determine the oral health awareness, practices, and knowledge using a self-administered questionnaire, which was available in English as well as the local Hindi language, to clinically check the oral health status of pregnant women with the help of the Community Pedontal Index for Treatment Needs, that is CPITN, to detect the parathyroid hormone levels longitudinally throughout the pregnancy and to compare the parathyroid hormone levels and the pedontal status of pregnant women longitudinally throughout their pregnancy. So the materials and methods used was the source of data were the 20 pregnant respondents that reported to the gynecology department of SGT Medical College Hospital and Research Institute, Gurugram Haryana. They were evaluated long longitudinally throughout their entire duration of pregnancy. Only the respondents who met with the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria were included in the study. The inclusion criteria included patients from the inception of their pregnancy till their delivery, patients of 18 to 40 years of age, and the patients who were willing to participate in our study. The exclusion criteria included females suffering from any systemic disease or with high-risk pregnancies. So the, the materials that we used were gloves, a mouth mask, a mouth mirror, a CPIT and probe with a WHO specification, a pair of tweezers, cotton and gauze. So this is a flow chart which is uh, showing us the whole study methodology. The inclusion criteria as discussed earlier was the patients were included from their pregnancy till their delivery, 18 to 40 years of age and willing to participate. Patients from suffering from any systemic disease or high-risk pregnancies were excluded. 
So the 20 pregnant respondents were surveyed for their oral health awareness practices and knowledge using a self-administered questionnaire, which was available both in Hindi and English. The pregnant respondents were evaluated for their oral health with the help of a community pedontal treatment index. It was aimed to screen and monitor individual or group pedontal treatment needs. The treat need was therefore intended to guide uh, to the level or magnitude of the need for care using the accepted pedontal criteria. For the detection of the parathyroid hormone levels, the blood sample was withdrawn from the pregnant respondents when they reported for their routine checkups. The evaluation of the parathyroid hormone was done using a chemiluminescent microparticle immunoassay method. The pedontal status and the parathyroid hormone levels were evaluated in every trimester of the pregnancy and the follow-up was done in the first trimester, that is 0 to 13 weeks. The second second trimester, which was 14 to 26 weeks, and the third trimester, which was 27 to 40 weeks, respectively. The comparison of the, uh, the parathyroid uh, pedontal status and the, of the respondents was done with the par parathyroid hormone status longitudinally throughout their pregnancy. Now, talking about the results. So, in the first part of the study, in this questionnaire, uh, this was the questionnaire that we had given to the females, in wherein the study, the questionnaire consisting of 12 questions to perceive the oral health awareness, practices, and knowledge among the pregnant females. The majority of the participants agreed that their oral health was good, but on evaluation of the periodontal indices among them, it showed that most of them had gingival disease. It also showed that their unawareness of the present oral health status and a need to intervene made them aware of the urgency to maintain the good health of uh, their oral cavity. And the reason for their lack of awareness was due to their less educational qualification and also a small number of awareness programs that were arranged by the government and the dentists themselves. Questions uh, asked to perceive the oral health practices showed their low awareness. This might be due to their low educational qualification, the lack of knowledge with regard to maternal and fetal health. Majority of the participants did not visit a dentist in the last six months and didn't brush twice a day or use any type of dental hygiene aids. The questions asked in order to understand the knowledge regarding the oral health knowledge, it was seen that majority of the respondents do not know the importance of oral health knowledge for better maternal and fetal health, but some of the respondents were ignorant of the fact that oral health knowledge enables the better health of both the mother and the fetus. Now, according to the demographic data that we collected, according to the demographic data, it was it was concluded that most of the respondents were 75 percent were young at the time of conception, which were between the ages of 20 to 30 years of age. And uh, it was concluded that 55 percent of the females resided in rural areas. According to the demographic data, it was also concluded that most of the respondents were less educated, that is 60 percent of them had not even completed their 12th standard, and while only 25% had received college education. Now, according to the CPITN index, we evaluated the pedontal status of pregnant females by the means of CPITN index. It was found that as the respondents progressed in their pregnancies, the pedontal findings were elevated as well as the treatment needs were increased as the trimesters progressed. We detected that, and according the when we come, uh, we detection of the parathyroid hormone levels during the pregnancy, we detected that the parathyroid hormone level longitudinally throughout the duration of the pregnancy, from the inception to the delivery of the patients, it was found that the PTH levels were lowered in the first trimester, then slightly elevated in the third trimester. Now, when we compared the parathyroid hormone levels and the pedontal status longitudinally throughout the pregnancy, we found by the use of a post hoc comparison using the Man Whitney U test, it showed a significant difference only when the CPI score 2 was compared with the CPI score 3. Rest, all the pairs failed to compare uh, to reach the level of statistical significance. The PTH levels were found to be significantly more among the subjects having a CPI 3 as compared to the CPI 2 readings. Now, the study, through this study, it was concluded that there's an increased need for gynecologists as well as dentists to work in cohesion when it comes to all around health of pregnant women. Due to the lack of awareness programs, it is apparent that most pregnant females do not realize the importance of good oral hygiene required for better maternal and fetal health. It is the need of the hour that the government awareness programs are increased to increase the awareness of maternal oral health. 
In this study, we evaluated the importance of parathyroid hormone being evaluated during the course of pregnancy. It was found that the periodontal status of pregnant women was correlated related to their periodontal finding or to their parathyroid hormone findings as they progressed in the pregnancies it is important to include the evaluation of parathyroid hormone level in the antenatal analysis of pregnant females as they report to the gynecologist in their first trimester of pregnancy so these are the research articles which were published in coherence with this study the first was a review article which was uh, uh, published in the International Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research. And it was a review article wherein we evaluated the effect of parathyroid hormone levels on the periodontal status of pregnant females, which was a review. And the next was published after the after I had completed my thesis and after the completion of my entire study. It was, an, it was published in the Journal of uh, SA Fork, that is the Journal of South Asian Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology wherein the entire uh, research work was published. It is a Scopus reviewed journal. Institute of Applied Medical Research at Sydney, Australia. And I am here to present my work on the anti-cancer potential of synergistic phytochemical combinations uh, and how the genetic profile of specific cancer cell line determine the efficacy of these synergistic phytochemical combinations, paving a path to precision medi medicine. So please join me to unravel the intricate relationship between efficacy of synergistic combinations and the unique genetic signature of these cancer cells. So let's begin with the disease which is which I am working on that is prostate cancer. So we all know that prostate cancer is a disease in which malignant cancer cells form in the tissues of the prostate, prostate gland of, of man. Prostate cancer is still the second leading cause of cancer death in American men and according to the american cancer society approximately one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during its lifetime uh, after diagnosis there's a variety of treatment which is followed for the, on the patents which include surgical resections radiation therapy hormonal therapy and chemotherapy um, usually although some patients are initially responsive to these therapy resistance usually occurs within one to two years um, multiple studies has now identified that um, and, and have suggested that the variety of uh, phytochemicals or the food which are rich in phytochemicals is linked to lowering the risk of fetal prostate cancer. Men with the highest plant-based diet score had a 19% lower risk of fetal prostate cancer versus men with the lowest diet score in a recent clinical trial. So what are phytochemicals? Phytochemicals are the bioactive non-nutrient components of the plants such as flavonoids, isoflavones or polyphenolic compounds uh, which has a potential um, health effects because of the antioxidant property. For example, you see resveratrol is a phytonutrient obtained from grapes. Um, green tea contain EGCG which is another phytonutrient. I3C is obtained from cruciferous vegetables. These uh, phytonutrients has antioxidant property thus it strengthens the immune system. They strengthen the immune system, reduces uh, cell inflammation and repair the DNA damage. This um, has an overall anti-cancerous and, and a therapeutic effect in various chronic diseases. The effect of these phytochemicals has not only confirmed in the preclinical studies but also has been confirmed in the clinical trial phase 1 and phase 2 and thus these phytochemicals are shown to be a promising candidates to at least maintain the cancer to stop the growth of the cancer cells. If you look at this slide, this slide clearly depicts the, uh, the effect of various phytochemicals on promoting the expression of uh, tumor, suppress, uh, tumor suppressive genes such as BRCA1, breast cancer, antigen 1 and 2, 
uh, p53 which is another uh, tumor suppressor gene however they inhibits the expression or stops the expression of tumor promoting genes such as EGFR, HER1, HER2 and KRAS. So this is um, a very important table and tell us that um, it works at a molecular level. These phytochemicals works at a molecular level levels to inhibit the cancer cell growth. Before going into my data, I would also like to highlight that various studies have now confirmed that phytochemicals work in combination. For example, here there is an example graph I have plotted for you where the anti-cancerous effect or antioxidant effect of an individual um, phytonutrients obtained from various fruits are much lesser when given in combination um, of all these fruits that is orange apple grapes and blueberry in combination these uh, phytonutrients are much more effective than what we see in as an uh, similarly there are here are the two studies which depicts the same phenomena where uh, when lycopene is given in combination with phytoene and phytofluene um, the anti cancerous effect or is, uh, the, epi uh, the effect by which it inhibits the cell prostate cancer cell for proliferation is much higher when these uh, phytonutrients are given alone another study also confirms that um, the uh, various phytonutrients including vitamin E when given in combination has much higher um, and inhibition of androgenal signaling in um, prostate cancer cells. This confirms that uh, phytochemicals are not as effective individually as they are in combinations. So for our studies, a study we have used various prostate cancer cell lines, basically Lenkip cell lines which are derived from a prostate carcinoma with androgen receptor expression whereas PC3 and DU145 cell lines are androgen unresponsive cells. Uh, PC3 cell line is um, obtained from dead full carcinoma with high metastatic potential. However, DU145 is a cell line from prostate carcinoma with moderated um, metastatic potential. Lenkip cell line is um, a cell line with low metastatic potential. The selection of these cell lines was performed to allow to cover an extended range of prostate cancer with different features namely different aggressiveness and different hormonal dependent dependency and metastatic potential. So next we have identified seven different highly potent phytochemicals based on the literature study which is commonly used um, in Mediterranean and Asian diets and uh, we assess the efficacy of these drugs individually on our three different prostate cancer cell lines that is LANK, PC3 and EU145. All these um, drugs should, should some effect on all the three different cancer cell lines uh, but EU145 has seems to be more sensitive uh, to, to, to these um, phytochemicals. I would also like to highlight that I3C potency seems to be similar in both DU145 and LANCAP cells but minimal in PC3 cells. So next we try to identify the synergy between various phytochemical combinations and we employed BLISS and HSA model. Uh, to identify cell line dependent responses. The most synergistic duo which you can see where red represents the highest synergy and the blue represents antagonism uh, was seen in I3C and quercetin in LENCAP and U145 cell lines. However, I3C and genstein was the highest synergistic combination for PC3 cell line. Maximal antagonistic response occurred with quercetin and genstein and highest concentration uh, of um, I3C and EGCG or EGCG curcumin uh, has the highest antagonistic response in DU, DU145. So we see that some combinations were additive at most concentrations for example equal in EGCG in both LANCAP and PC3 cells and curcumin and equal in DU145 cells. 
um, there is uh, what we could we know that there's a genetic difference in between these cell lines which could be the cause of the variation which we see uh, as a combinations which are potent or which are synergistic versus antagonistics so but despite this heterogeneous heterogeneity all combinations so synergy in at least one model next we plotted the dose response for each phytochemicals with its maximal synergistic partner in each cell line and the relative dose response of the phytochemicals can be seen here in this table uh, if you see these circle plots, each arrow represents a specific combination and the thickness of the plot uh, represents the, uh, the power or the uh, power of the synergistic combination. The thicker the line, it is the most synergistic combination we can see in that specific cell line. So the results represents that the most potent combination in land cap cells and in PC3 cells was IC3 and I3C and quercetine. Uh, however, despite displaying lower synergy in um, um, in DU145 compared to I3C and quercetine, resveratrol and E. coli seems to be the most potent. So the most overall, the I3C displays the most synergistic combination with other drugs, including curcumin. So overall, we saw a significant variation in the potency of specific synergistic combination in three different cell lines. And we know that these cell lines are genetically different, different and obtained from uh, different individuals at different uh, cancer stages. So the only thought which comes to our mind is that the genetics uh, is responsible, uh, responsible for the differences which we are observing in the efficacy of specific synergistic combinations. And it is now well known that several genetic variations are able to modulate the bioavailability and metabolism of phytochemicals in humans. And with that thought, um, it has been, we have realized that it is not uh, all fit in all phenomena as for other things in, um, in cancer chemotherapy. Uh, we have to be very particular about identifying the genetic background and um, and determine which um, phytochemical combination would be effective for a specific individual. Now we hypothesize that it's the genetic makeup of the cell lines which causes differences in the efficacy of specific phytochemical combinations. Then uh, to investigate that we employed network pharmacology to and analyze the interaction of phytochemical targets with prostate cancer disease causing interactome and also data pathway enrichment analysis uh, what uh, what uh, on our network pharmacology analysis what we found is that um, uh, i3c and quercetin network does not involve a direct interaction with the p10 um, gene so which is also found to be absent in land cap and PC3 cells. However, E. coli and um, resveratrol, which is a highly potent uh, combination for DU145 cells, had a direct uh, a target of P10 proteins, suggesting that uh, the genetic makeup or specific genes expressed in a specific cell line is causing the difference in the efficacy of a specific combination and this is just one part of story uh, for uh, for to analyze the complete um, um, a status of this uh, phytochemical combinations to be the given to the drug there is a whole uh, lot of detailed analysis to be done where e the effects of every gene or or the role of every gene in uh, efficacy of uh, uh, of phytochemical combinations can be determined. Uh, this is paving the path to after having a detailed analysis on the genetic differences of each cell line and their interaction uh, of synergistic uh, combinations uh, based on the genetic makeup of the cell lines. We um, shortlisted various genes which are clearly different in between the uh, three cell lines um, uh, to prove our hypothesis that it's the genetic makeup of the cell lines which causes the difference in the efficacy of these phytochemicals. So we, uh, if you see here in the table, and I just want to highlight this position where you see there's a clear difference between the uh, presence of um, P10 EPH 
B2 like proteins which are tumor suppressor proteins which are absent in plant cap and PC3 but are expressed in the U145 cell line. Next next we try to hypothesize uh, that it's the presence of p10 or the genetic makeup of these cell lines which is ca causing or the lead cause of the difference in the potency of specific phytochemical combinations so to prove that we had uh, we planned a p10 knockout knockdown experiments first of all i would like to remind you that pc3 cells is a p10 null cell and in this um, cell type we found i3c and resveratrol has the highest potency whereas du145 cell lines which are p10 positive cell lines in this resveratrol and equal uh, combination showed the high uh, the the highest potency whereas i3c and chlorocetine is uh, showed very poor potency um, or the killing of cancer cells so we now know that the u145 are p10 positive cells and equal and resveratrol were the highest potent uh, uh, phytochemical combinations which can uh, kill these cells so what we did is we used siRNA to inhibit the expression of p10 genes in um, the u145 cells and to our surprise what we found is that um, uh, by reducing p10 expression in these cells cell types the efficacy of a call and resveratrol decreases significantly at all different concentration we tested however uh, there is no change in the potency of ic3 and quercetine uh, when you reduce the expression of p10 siRNA which suggests that the potency of uh, of i3c and um, twercetin does not depend on the expression of p10 but the the, the efficacy or the potency of echol and resveratrol do depends on the presence of p10 expression uh, and that's that's clearly um, resonates with our hypothesis that it's the expression of specific genes or the genetic difference which are observed in these cell types are causing the variation in the potency of these um, phytochemical combinations and this is a great step as it so for summary to summarize our study has identified the patterns of synergy that are dependent on tumor cell genotype and but are independent of androgen signaling uh, or, or being very specific what we have identified the effect of p10 expression on um, the efficacy of a specific phytochemical combination so you, in this figure you see that there's a du 145 cells which is labeled as blue and a len cap cell or a pc3 cell which are labeled as orange and the maximum synergistic combination i3 c and quercetin has its direct target in the uh, prostate cancer causing intractome um, and also but when absent um, but for um, equal and resveratrol it's the p10 expression which is crucial for its efficacy so if p10 is absent the individuals with no p10 expression would not have the same beneficial effect observed with the combination of equal and resveratrol but for them i3c and quercetin combination would work uh, perfectly so this um, whole project uh, paves a whole new pathway for clinical unit utility where we are proposing that um, the patients with prostate cancer first has to undergo genetic profiling by, the, by either by liquid biopsy or tumor biopsy and then a whole network pharmacology analysis was is is next to be done to investigate the best combinations for specific individuals which would be based on their specific uh, genotype as it is um, um, paving a path to precision medicine approach uh, which we do normally see in our classical chemotherapy where each individual does not have the same effect or the same beneficial effect for any chemotherapy and this is very much applicable to our phytochemical anti-cancer regime or chemo prevention regime so what we are proposing here is that what is important is first to identify the genetic makeup and uh, the environmental or the lifestyle of that particular um, patient 
function and uh, we have to do a high throughput sequencing to analyze the genetic makeup of these individuals based on that these um, genes were then subjected to system biology along with the drug interactome analysis which was then defined which drugs or which phytochemical combination would be best suited suited for specific individuals and this uh, and this i think this is the major reason why um, the phytochemical approach or the use of neutroceuticals uh, to inhibit um, or control or prevent ca um, cancer has not been utilized to a broader aspect uh, because um, the sensitivity we need is not yet achieved using an all fit approach we need a tailored approach um, and a precision medicine approach even for phytochemicals and then we may go a far, far longer distance than what we are at now um, saying that i would now like to thanks um, the audience for their time and the patients for listening um, and uh, also would like to thank, uh, extend my thanks to the organizer who has invited me to present my work at this conference. Um, and before leaving, just want to highlight that like any other approach, any other classical anti-cancer therapy, phytochemicals do require a personalized precision approach uh, to, to combat cancer safely. Thank you. Determination of pre-harvest interval for lambda cyhalothin, delta vaccine cyphernectin, and fenbalaripitin for functional vegetables of Bangladesh. The introduction of, uh, I'd like to say uh, some key words about this. We all know that vegetables are very important for nutritional, financial, and food security in the country, these vegetables are attacked by a variety of insectors. The farmers may have the option to use some IPM technologies like indigenous plant extract, biological pesticides, and biopesticides instead of toxic chemicals. But it is not uh, now uh, because this technology is not sustainable at all. Due to the scarcity of competent pesticide alternatives and an knowledge of safe pest management, in Bangladesh, the farmers mostly depend on chemical pesticides, pesticide to protect their crops from pest infestation. It was understood from a, a study that the farmers mostly use insecticide irrationally and clinically. A considerable number of farmers sell vegetables immediate after spray or at an interval of one or two days after spray. Pesticide residue hamper microbial activities in soil, destroy aquatic leaves and non target in invertebrate, and cause inner vertebrates to higher vertebrate also. We know that pesticides create several adverse effects on human health and the environment. There is a link between pesticide exposure and the Incidence of human chronic disease affecting nervous reproductive system, renal, cardiovascular, and respiratory system also. And sometimes it may occur pregnancies, ulcer, cancer, etc. With the justification of the experiment, pesticides are not used by the farmers following good agriculture practices. The farmers are using pesticides indiscriminately and the harvest is treated crops without maintaining the pre-harvest interval. It was reported that only 3% eggplant farmers practice the pre-harvest interval at a safe level, whereas 97% eggplant farmers fall into safe, unsafe categories. As a result, the residues of pesticides may remain in the harvested vegetables. The aim of the study is uh, that to ensure safe food to the consumers. Now, what is PSI? PSI is defined as the number of days required to lapse 
between the date of pesticide application and crop harvest. The B side differs from pesticide to pesticide and crop to crop also. So we have to determine the pre harvest interval on, on the consideration of our environmental condition. Food products become safe for consumption only after pre harvest interval or within the period has left. The PSI differs from pesticide to pesticide and crop to crop also. So we have to reset the PSI on the consideration of our environmental condition. With this view, uh, we design our experiments. The main objective of this experiment was to determine the pre harvest interval that is waiting period for lambda cyhalokin, delta methyl, cyphermethyl, and phenbalarin in eggplant. Hyacin bean and polyflower. These are the methodology. The purity of formulated insecticide were tested in the pesticide analytic laboratory. This is an accredited laboratory, ISO IC 17 of 2017. 100% pure brand were selected for the determination of pre harvest interval. Pure brand of uh, selected pesticides were sprayed at Different supervised trials, five different supervised trials. Sprays are made with recommended dose by next expert to the point of runoff. Samples of eggplant, hyacin beef, and coniflor are collected at zero to 11 days after spray. This is the pictorial view of sample collection and uh, insecticide spray on the field. This is the pictorial presentation of uh, sample cleanup and injection in DC. I'm not going in detail on it. This is our laboratory. This is a flow diagram of uh, sample uh, cleanup. Normally, we uh, follow uh, a method. We all know that quick, easy, cheap, effective target and set method. This method is modified uh, by Stodan et al. Uh, we follow this method. Following this method, we clean up our samples. Now, this is the instrument parameter of pyrethroid pesticides. We use equipment GC2010 electron capture detector. Capillary column was RTXL pesticide 2. Makeup gas and carrier gas was nitrogen. Induction port temperature was 2080 degree centigrade. Initial temperature was 160 degree centigrade, which went up to 270 degree centigrade. Detector temperature was 30 degree centigrade. This is the chromatogram made with 1 ppm concentration of lambda science center in a plant run by GC ECD. We its peak was characterized by its retention time. The retention time of lambda cyhalothin was 10.320 minutes. During the study, recovery tests were conducted with the 45 samples of hyacinth with polyflor and eggplant. The satisfactory, satisfactory recovery is 86 to 110 percent with uh, RSDR. It's less than or equal to 7% are found for ease of the matrices. The LOD range from 0 0.002 to 0 0.004 milligram per kg. And the LQ for all the selected pesticides are set at 0 0.01 milligram per kg. The linearity was very good and coefficient of determination was is greater than or equal to 0 0.996 for all of the matrices for matrix based calibration standard are used. We uh, calculate our results by uh, GC inbuilt software and compared with the maximum residue limit. Maximum residue limit is the permissible limit or legal limit of pesticides that we consume and no harmful at all. And MRL is measured by how many parts of pesticide are present per million parts of commodity.
first table uh, uh, table sorry pesticide residue detected from eggplant uh, first column shows the days after showing and the fourth column shows the detected uh, residue the residue of eggplant uh, detected up to nine days and the quantities are above mrl up to seven ds so the psi can be selected at eight ds here you see the eu mrl was uh, zero point uh, 3 milligram per kg and uh, in case of uh, seven days after spray it was uh, 3.17 milligram per kg so the psi will be next following days that means eight days after spray will be safe for a plant uh, cauliflower the detected residue uh, the uh, residue of Cypermethin in cauliflower. The mute, I guess. Estimated from cauliflower. The first column shows the days after uh, spraying, and the fourth column shows the detected residue of cypermethin in, in cauliflower. Uh, the cypermethin uh, uh, residue detected up to seven days, and the quantities are above MRL up to four days. So the uh, piece I can be selected at five days after spray. Table four, level of pesticide of fat valerate estimated from hyacinth beans and cauliflower. First column shows the days after spraying and the second column shows the residue level uh, of uh, residue level of fat valerate in hyacinth beans, which detected up to 10 days after spray. And the quantities are above MRL up to eight days so the psi can be selected at 10 days after spray in, but in case of cauliflower the detected residue are also 10 days after spray and the uh, quantities are above mrl up to nine days after spray so the psi can be selected at uh, 10 days after spray the trend of uh, figure one shows the trend of Degradation of detected residue of pesticide in vegetables over time. Uh, here we see that uh, the cypermethin uh, degrade faster in cauliflower, and in case of fenvalerate, and in case of uh, fenvalerate, it was longer period of time both in cauliflower and hyacinth bean. When you apply pesticide on your crops, to combat pest infestation, uh, they degrade its metabolites. When we spray cypermethin in our crop, cyper, uh, uh, it degrades its metabol metabolite also. Uh, cypermethin is metabolized uh, to phenoxybenzoic acid and cyclopropane carbolic acid. Phenoxybenzoic acid was quicker degraded than cyclopropane carbolic acid. The eight isomer of constitute that constitute cypermethin is a metabolic pathway of cypermethin in plant. In case of delta methin, its metabolite was 3 phenoxybenzoic acid. The delta methin is toxic to aquatic life, particularly fish, although particularly in fish, it is an allergens and causes asthma in some people also. An increase of lambda cyhalothin is metabolized was for hydroxy phenoxybenzoic acid and 3 phenoxybenzoic acid. The primary acute toxic effect of lambda cyhalothin is neurotoxicity. We all know that cybernectin uh, synthetic pyrethroid are neurotoxic uh, shows neurotoxicity. In case of fenvalerate, its metabolite, uh, its, uh, it, its metabolite, uh, peak chlorophyll isomorphic acid uh, may cause nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, headache, dizziness, uh, and uh, hypersensitivity and salivation also. 
so uh, when we spray pesticides on a crop, uh, they degrade its metabolite, and these metabolites are highly toxic than parent compound. So if you uh, want to uh, consume safe vegetables, you should maintain the PSI. Otherwise, the uh, pesticide may contain on your vegetables. The presence of pesticide residue above the MRL in food commodity might be harmful to human. Uh, it is, if it is exceeded acceptable daily intake of adults and babies also. Now conclusion, farmers are advised to maintain determined PSI because PSI is a critical component of good agricultural practices which ensure their crop are safe for consumption. So, more efforts in pesticide research, particularly determination of pre-harvest interval, are needed in different pesticides and crops for safe food production. The findings of the present study will provide a good indication for the farmers, policy planners, and other relevant stakeholders to take necessary action to ensure safe food production for the consumers. This is the reference. Uh, I put uh, some of the reference here. I am not going uh, in detail. Uh, this is all of my presentation. Thanks for patience hearing. Thank you so much. and the effect of selenium supplementation on egg production during early and mid laying period. So myself, Dr. N. Nani Lakshmi, I'm principal scientist. I'm working at Directorate of Poultry Research, Rajendra Nagar, Hyderabad. So this is our institute. And now the breeds on which I'm going to speak is on Gagar and Nicobal. These two are native breeds of India. So, Gagar breed is mainly again, this is found in polar districts and adjoining locations of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Annual egg production is 45 to 60, and the birds are maintained largely for eggs and are also being reared in backyard farming system. Now, the Nicobari. This is a bird native to Nicobar Island and it is brownish matte in color. Annual egg production varies from 180 to 200. So this is high egg producing and this is low egg producing bird, native birds. The birds are maintained largely for eggs. They are also reared under farm and field conditions. Now the two hormones on which I am going to speak and melatonin and ghrelin. This green part is ghrelin, which is 28 amino acids in length. Now, what is the function of melatonin? It improves feed efficiency, promotes growth, promotes elevated cellular and humoral immune responses, enhances the intestinal absorption of amino acids, increases egg weight and egg laying rate, Increases intestinal mucosa renewal. It is present in egg yolk and abdomen, and its level in mucosa, that is intestine, exceeds than that present in the blood. So, what is being excreted from the GI tract, that is gastrointestinal tract, is independent of pineal gland, and this is secreted during daylight, which is independent of photoperiod. So I have used the levels of melatonin, which is being secreted during daylight. Increase the activity of antioxidant in the jejunum and down regulates the expression of gonadotropin inhibitory hormone receptor in the ovary. Now coming to the functions of ghrelin, it's an ant or exogenic gut derived peptide in chicken. It is implicated in supporting reproductive function at hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis. High and low levels of ghrelin appear to be detrimental for fertility. 
is able to reduce plasma progesterone levels and is able to influence chicken ovarian steroid hormones that is estrogen and progesterone. Now, the importance of ghrelin is in integrating nutrition and reproduction. It has a functional role of ghrelin in chicken ovary and it could be reduced by exogenous melatonin. Now, the benefits of organic selenium in animal or poultry diet, it is able to maintain immunocompetence, production, reproductive performance. It is an important part of antioxidant system. That is, it is present in antioxidant enzymes such as glutathione peroxidase, thioredoxin reductase, glutathione reductase, and also iodothyronine D iodinase is a part of the enzyme of the thyroid gland. Now, the root for the synthesis of melatonin from tryptophan. Tryptophan is converted to hydrotoxin, tryptophan to serotonin, to anesthetizer, to melatonin. Now, all of us know about the amino acids. There are amino acid transporters which are transported across the plasma membrane into the cell where it can be used for protein synthesis and cellular process or it can get metabolized and secreted outside. Now the objectives for my uh, project, it was a small, it is a small portion of my project. So the objectives for this experiment were to estimate melatonin and ghrelin in plasma and their receptor expression in jejunum. Jejunum is a portion of the digestive tract and magnum is a portion of the uh, reproductive tract where the albumin is being synthesized. Of native breed, gaggers and nicobari during early and peak laying period to study relationship between level of hormones, amino acids, expression of amino acid transporters, and differential egg production at two different phases of laying period. The third was to observe the effect of supplementation of organic selenium in modulation of different parameters mentioned. Now, the methodology was a hundred number each of 24 week old. Gaggers or Nicobari were taken and it, the study was conducted in two different phases. That is early laying period, that is 24 to 28 weeks and mid laying period is 32 to 36 weeks of age. The control group was given basal feed with maize and soya bean and it was not supplemented with organic selenium. Whereas treatment group was supplemented with organic products, that is selenium enriched yeast at the rate of 0.2 ppm. Blood samples were collected at weekly interval and body weight was recorded at 14 day interval. Now the studies were conducted on hormones, amino acids and gene expression studies were conducted. The girls were sacrificed at 26 and 34 weeks of age for collection of jejunum and magnum tissues. Hormones melatonin, ghrelin, estradiol, and progesterone were estimated by EIA, that is enzyme amino assay. And estimation of amino acids in plasma and magnum tissues was done by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, that is by LCMS method. Quantification of gene expression of melatonin ghrelin receptors and amino acid transporters in these tissues was conducted by using cyber green for quantitative PCR method or real-time PCR method. Now coming to the results, we had seen that in Jagger, the this is the control group and this is the treatment group. In the control group, during the early day period, it was approximately 300 uh, picograms per ml. But whereas during the mid day period, it was 200 picograms. So during the NT period, the concentration was low and by providing selenium, we, we could see that 
chemical low, it stimulated the levels of the hormone during mid laying period. But whereas in ovary, the melatonin levels were more during the were less during the E T period, that was about 75 when you take the average levels. Whereas during the N T period, it was 150, it was greater. So when the concentrations were less, the selenium supplementation could uh, stimulate or increase the levels of this melatonin during the early laying period. Now, when we compare between the control groups of Jagger and Nicobari, it was always seen that the levels of these hormones were low in Nicobari breed compared to the Jagger. But what is the reason? That is in Jagger, it is a low producing one. And Nicobari is a high producing bird. So you see, the consumption of melatonin was more in the Nicobari compared to the Jagger. So the levels were found to be less in Nicobari compared to the Jagger. Now coming to the ghrelin hormone, we saw that this was quite different from melatonin. That it, it increased, it increased in the age and it was more during the NT period. The, if you take the average, it is more during the NT period compared to the ET period. So you see when the levels were low during the ET period, by supplementation of selenium, it increased the levels of uh, ghrelin. Now coming to the Nicobari, the similar trend was found and it was found that it was slightly lower in the ET period and higher during the NT period. But and the, it could stimulate ghrelin during NT period in the Nicobari bird. Now we compared between the controls of Nagas and Nicobari, it was not significantly different for this hormone. Now coming to the estradiol, we saw, it was seen that again in the Gagger, in the control group, during the early period, it was high, whereas during MP period, it was low. But the effect of selenium was not significantly different, either at early or mid period. Similar effect was seen in Nicobari. In whereas in Nicobari, the concentration was less during early period and it was high during NP period, but the effect of selenium was not seen, not tested out. Now, when we compare between the two uh, breeds, the concentration of estradiol was significantly less during the early period in Nicobari compared to the Gagger, whereas during the NP period, it was more compared to the Gagger. This is because at the NP period, the uh, egg production is significantly high in Nicobari. That is, it is 80% and whereas in Gagger, it is 50%, which I'll be showing in subsequent slides. Now coming to the progesterone, again it was high in Gagger during ET and it is less during MP. The effect of selenium was quite different as with respect to other hormones that it decreased the concentration of progesterone or on uh, supplementation of selenium. That is, it is causing more utilization of progesterone for increased egg production in Gagger. Now coming to the Nicobari again, during ET period, it was more and during MP period, it was significantly less. And the effect was more during ET period, the effect of selenium by decreasing the levels of progesterone, showing that it is making the consumption of progesterone more in this Nicobari bird during ET. Now, when we compared between the control groups, it was observed that the progesterone levels were less in Nicobari breed compared to the Zagas. 
again showing that the utilization is more than Nicobi for the egg laying compared to the Gagas breed, which is having less egg production. Now, this is the pictorial representation with the value given here of whatever I had submitted. Now, coming with respect to the effect of supplementation, this is control treatment. This is for egg number control and treatment. It could be seen that there was no significant effect on body weight of the bird, but it definitely increased the percentage of egg production in at 26 weeks and 28 weeks, and also at 36 weeks upon supplementation of selenium. So this shows that even though this is a native breed and it has got less egg production, by giving a supplement like organic selenium, we can increase the percentage of egg production. Whereas in Nicobari, we saw a different uh, effect. That is, in the early period, it significantly increased the body weight as well as the egg weight. So the numbers represented in brackets are egg weights, but no significant effect on egg number. So upon at least by two um, grams, it has increased the egg weight and body weight during early period, but during mid period, there was increase in egg production, but it was very less at about 2% increase. Now this is the representation with all values. Now, what I want to show here is what how the levels are varying when I compare between the two breeds. Now, compared to melatonin you and grelin, you we saw that melatonin is higher in daggers, estradiol, and progesterone during early period, and during uh, melatonin and estradiol are less in nicobari during early period. But whereas grelin and progesterone were following the same trend in both the species of uh, breed, during early period it was less and during uh, progesterone was higher during early period. Egg production, it is well known at early period that it is less in both the breed, breeds and during mid period it is more. Now what is the relation of these hormones with respect to egg production? It was seen that in gaggles, melatonin, estradiol, and progesterone were inversely proportional to egg production, whereas in Nicobari, melatonin, ghrelin, and estradiol were directly related to egg production. Maybe this may be due to the differential rate of egg production in the two breeds. Now, the treatment effect, it was seen that in gaggles, in melatonin at MT it increased, whereas in Nicobari at MT, whereas ghrelin at MT, and this at MT. Whereas for progesterone, the selenium supplementation it decreased in both the species, mainly for egg production. Now coming to the amino acid, we saw that in Gagas, this is for control group. There are 19 amino acids. And it was seen that the one which are in blue color, they are greater in concentration compared to the gaggle. So in Nicobari, during early period, they were more in amount. And whereas in gaggle, it was more in amount during MT period. So this shows that the availability of the amino acids was more for the MT period than the Sorry, for the EP period, when the percentage of egg production is less in Nicobari, and whereas it decreased during the MP period, when its production increases. Now, seeing the effect of selenium on these amino acids, the net effect what it was observed that in Gagas by, treat, uh, by treatment, it was less 16 amino acid concentration decreased, whereas in Nicobar, the 12 amino acid concentration increased. So we can see a uh, different effect. In Gagas, it is decreasing, 
whereas in eco bari it is increasing now coming to the mp period the net effect what we saw in bagel yet mp it was increasing 13 amino acids number of amino acids increased whereas in bagel it was number of amino acids were decreasing so it is seen that at e2 in bagel it was decreasing more number of amino acids whereas in nicobari at mp by treatment it was the more number of amino acids decreased so we saw a differential effect of the effect of selenium in gagas and nicobari on level of plasma amino acids now when we compared the controls group between the two groups it was seen that during mp the concentration of amino acids was less in gagas compared to nicobari whereas in whereas in nicobari whereas in nicobari it was more during et period so the next effect was to study the gene expression studies so we extracted rna from tissue sample and saw on agarose gel and then we found the pcr amplicon for actin primer from all the tissue sample and these are different pcr uh, amplicons for the six genes which we studied on uh, uh, 1.5 1000 uh, agarose gel no gene expression studies mntr and ghrelin mntr and ghrelin are the receptors for melatonin and ghrelin whereas bat lat4 cat and lat2 are amino acid transporters so this is during the early period so as in gagger we had seen that by treatment it increased the receptor levels of both melatonin and ghrelin as well as the expression of the amino acid transporters in jejunum as well as in magnum and here in gagger whereas in gagger at 34 weeks we had seen that in it was less the effect of selenium on expression was less in jejunum and magnum both at the mid laying period whereas in nicobari the effect was different that is during et period the uh, significant effect uh, was less during et period however it was there on the amino acid transporter the et but whereas we had seen more number of amino acid transporters as well as receptors for hormones was more during mp period in nicobari breed in jejunum and magnum at the uh, mp period now the effect of selenium treatment it was seen it was seen that there was up regulation of magnum amino acid transporter which was directly proportional to egg production in both the breeds jejunum and magnum amino acid transporter expression was inversely related to the concentration of number of plasma amino acids this shows that in the um, organism uh, homeostasis was maintained now this is the representation of the graph for what all i had shown in the tabular form now coming to the summary concentration of melatonin estradiol progesterone at mp they were greater than mp in hagel and it was reversed with hormone ghrelin whereas the reverse trend was observed with hormones in nicobari that is at mp they were greater than mp only progesterone was greater at mp compared to mp supplementation of selenium increased melatonin during mp in hagel whereas in nicobari during mp effect on levels of ghrelin was reversed supplementation did not have any effect on the levels of estradiol in both gagas and nicobari at either mp or mp in gagas it decreased levels of progesterone at both mp and mp whereas in nicobari only during mp when compared between the control groups the availability of plasma amino acids was less 
during MC compared to EC in both Magos and Nicobari. Upon treatment, concentration decreased in Magos and increased in Nicobari at EC. The reverse was observed during MC. In Gagos, four change expression of more number of amino acid transporters was higher in jejunum and magnum upon treatment during EC compared to MC, whereas the results were reversed in Nicobari. Now, compared, coming to the conclusions, there were many factors or physiological parameters which were reversed when compared between the two groups. When concentration was hormone was higher, treatment reduced the concentration and vice versa during EC or MC. But effect of treatment was inverse with respect to concentration of amino acid. The four change expression of receptor or amino acid transporter was inversely proportional to the concentration of hormones upon treatment, maintaining homeostasis of the levels of hormones or amino acid. The selenium treatment, so in a nutshell, we can say in the end, the selenium treatment modulated all the physiological parameters conducively, resulting in increase in production performance. Thank you. of nitrous are used in sport due to their ergogenic properties. What does it mean ergogenic? Ergogenic supplements are supplements uh, which can improve performance of athletes. So bitter juice, pomegranate extract and green leafy vegetables constitute significant sources of dietary nitrates. In 2018, the International Society of Sport Nutrition categorized nitrates under the second group of supplements with limited and mixed evidence of their efficacy in terms of ergogenic properties. Nitrates intake increases circulating nitrate levels, which are then reduced to bioactive nitrite in the saliva and further converted into molecule NO in the stomach. Such NO supplements endogenous in all produced by oxidation of L-arginine. Catalyzing nitrite to NO in blood is facilitated by low oxygen availability. These conditions exist in skeletal muscles during enduring exercise. By mediating smooth muscle relaxation, and all promotes vasodilatation, increasing oxygen delivery to skeletal muscles. After ingestion of nitrate supplement, plasma nitrate levels peak after one, two hours, while nitrite after two, three hours, and both levels return to baseline after about 24 hours. Although uh, the addition of nitrous to food is established to improve exercise tolerance in healthy young men. But this issue has been open for debate till 2020. Uh, the results of uh, placebo controlled studies of the effects of dietary nitrous on exercise performance were summarized in a recent, recent systematic review and meta analysis. According to this review, nitrate supplementation improves power output, time to exhaustion, and distant cover, but has no influence on perceived exertion, time result, uh, work done, like that production. So uh, nitrate lead to reduction in VU2 during exercise of varying the intensity. So the available data from randomized trials suggest that nitrate supplements contribute to improving in endurance exercise performance by reducing oxygen consumption. In other words, nitrate increases the efficacy of using oxygen to provide energy to working muscles. 
Further, uh, the consensus of experts uh, on the use of dietary nitrates from May uh, 2023. Uh, some consensus findings shortly. Uh, if you want uh, to take nitrate as a gogenic supplement, you need taking uh, in, into account aerobic uh, training because the effect of dietary nitrates are reduced in individuals with higher aerobic endurance. Second, uh, recommended intake to get the ergogenic effect of nitrates is 8, 16 millimol of nitrates one with a meal or 4, 16 millimol per day when taken as a course. Uh, third, uh, the current consensus among experts suggest that the addition of nitrates in food at doses up to 16 millimol per day are safe and doesn't increase the risk of cancer, hypotension, or kidney damage. But there is no consensus uh, on whether long-term ingestion of nitrates from food more likely cause ergogenic effect than acute supplementation caused by controversy uh, in existing data and lack of study directly comparing strategies of acute and long-term intake of nitrates. The expert group agreed that dietary nitrates are ergogenic if they are present either in the form of bitter juice or as nitrate salts. The group of experts uh, agreed that there was no evidence of harmful effect from consuming dietary nitrates together with nitrate-rich food or juices. And uh, last one, the expert group agreed that both acute and long-term intake of food supplements with nitrates doesn't violate the spirit of sports and doesn't provide unfair advantage to those who use them. The aim of our study was to evaluate the effect of long-term intake of nitrates in the form of beetroot juice-based dietary supplement on cardiorespiratory endurance of biathletes in a training camp. Our prospective randomized and controlled uh, research was conducted during the summer training camp. Uh, the athletes were divided randomly into two groups, an experimental group receiving a food supplement with nitrates and comparison group receiving a placebo. Placebo was a water with food coloring. The study involved 40 male biathletes, 20 individuals in the experimental group and 20 individuals in the comparison group. While uh, with um, level of sport training ranging from candidate master of sport to master of sport. The athletes uh, were in a training camp setting, which included two training uh, sessions per day, six days a week during 20 days. The uh, supplement with nitrate uh, was a liquid with the main ingredient being concentrated bitter juice, and as additional ingredient, the supplement contains source of iron and source of polyphenol. Before the intake of supplement and after 20 days of intake, measurement, measurements were conducted on submaximal exercise testing performance on psychoegometer until exhaustion. Uh, 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 cardio respiratory parameters were uh, heart rate at the anaerobic threshold, maximum heart rate, workload at the anaerobic threshold, maximum workload, VU2, and time to exhaustion. The initial resistance on cycle was 200 watts and increased by 25 watts every minute. Um, card parameters of Athletes' cardiorespiratory system, a metabolograph fit uh, mat pro was used to measure it. And the significance of the difference was assumed using t-test statistics. 
So uh, our results. Uh, this table shows that in the control group of athletes uh, who didn't take nitrate supplement, there were not significant changes in the indicator of uh, cardiorespiratory exercise test hour 20 days. While in the experimental group of athletes after 20 days of bitter juice intake, there was a significant increase in heart rate at the anaerobic threshold and decrease in view two. These changes indicate indicate a decrease in oxygen consumption per kilogram of body mass, which shows an increase in muscle work efficacy. So uh, our summary. Thus, we have got results similar to the ones of previous study of the influence of butyr juice as a source of dietary nitrous on physical performance. The intake of dietary nitrous increased Athletes endurance by reduction in oxygen consumption and their achievement of the maximum aerobic power output at higher heart rate values during low testing until exhaustion. It's important to note uh, that our findings demonstrate the presence of an ergogenic effect of bitter juice during 20 day course of intake even when the product is consumed immediately after exercise, rather than ju just a few hours before as described in most previous studies. And the addition of iron to bit bitter juice leads to increases of physiological effect of nitrates, even at a concentration lower than that described in the literature for uh, millimole per day. Thus, it can be assumed uh, that there is a synergistic action of uh, nitrates and iron supplements on athlete endurance. Thank you for your attention. I'm glad to be part of this conference. Mexico City. I present the follow following poster in Thailand. Malnutrition, an overview from biotics. A background. We know that millions of people continue to suffer from poverty and malnutrition around the world due to armed conflict, as well as climate change and the resulting natural disaster. disaster. It's bear repeating it over and over again. Poverty, inequalities, lack of access to basic resources. So such as food, drinking water, health, education, housing, are a serious humiliation to human dignity. It should be noted that malnutrition is a public health issue loaded with a strong ethical component. It is a disease as a condition of bodily suffering and limit the possibility of uh, personal development. Uh, besides, malnutrition is one of the world's most serious but least addressed development challenges. Its human and economic costs are enormous falling harder on the poor, women, and children. The double burden of malnutrition is the coexistence of overnutrition, overweight, and obesity, alongside undernutrition, stouting, and wasting at all levels on the population, country, city, community, household, and individual. According to the National Commission of Bioethics, bioethics is not only is as a discipline, but also its principal and, and component, components are immediately linked with the generation and the application on the science. In other words, it is considered an important component to contribute to the well-being and integrity of the human being and, this, and his environment. It is the branch of applied ethics that reflects, deliberates, 
and makes regu regulatory approaches and not public politic to regulate and to solve conflict concerning social life. In particular, in the practice and medical research that affect life in the planet. The aim, the objective is this theoretically based ESA is, is to provide an over overview of the res relationship between bioethics, human malnutrition, and its consequences. Uh, the Mexican National Health and Nutrition Survey is a probabilistic household level survey, which assigned to each Mexican household uh, now value measures to zero as probability of, of selection. A method, descriptive docu documental study. The Mexican National Health and Nutrition Survey was designed to obtain information on the health and nutrition status of, of the Mexican population, based on a nationally representative sample. Uh, results. It is important to mention that the prevalence of overweight and obesity has increased worldwide in the last three decades, affecting to uh, every three adults. In Mexico, this has been documented that in the last two decades, some of the comor comorbidities associated with obesity contribute to a larger percentage of mortality, disability, and premature death in the population. Due to this, obesity is currently considered one of the main public health problems in the country. Uh, figure two shows the prevalence of, of overweight and obesity in men aged 20 to 24 night years old. It is observed that the prevalence of overweight and obesity was 41.3% and 19.4% in the years 2000, respectively. A gradual both sustained increase was recorded until 2020. Uh, to, re to remember that obesity is a disease that causes fungal impairment and reduce quality of life, serious disease, and more early deaths. Uh, figure three shows the trend of overweight obesity in women during the period from 1988 to 2020 in Mexico. In this period, the prevalence of obesity increased from 9.5% in 1988 to 37.6% in 2020. Regarding overweight, the growth was notable from 1988, 25%, to 1999, 36%. Since then, has remained uh, with how significant change in time 2020. The studies have sh shown that obesity increases the risk of many chronic disorders, in including, including cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and even several cancer types. In addition, our growing barrio research has revealed that obese women are at a high risk for reproductive health. It's known that maternal obesity increases the prevalence on future metabolic dysfunction and malformation in the offspring. A figure a four, four um, for the trends of overweight, overweight pardon, over uh, an obesity prevalences among children uh, from five to 11 years old. Notably, we observed that a decrease in overweight was reported throughout the survey, survey years. At the expense 
of increases in obesity, where today uh, these two outcomes show similar behavior. The overweight obesity is school age children is a continuing problem with serious repercussion on the future. Uh, despite current of the a barrier of individual and global level public policy action uh, for the containment, prevention, and control of, of this condition, a structural factor exists uh, which requires early action, a significant investment. These actions are needed in order to modify and contract a healthy and sustainable diet of children. Uh, figure five, over the past few decades, several upper and middle-income countries, Mexico included, has experienced significant epidemiological changes. Concurrently, eating patterns, nutritional status, and this is burden of the population and have been radically modified. For rapid urbanization, demographic changes, uh, the modification of the dietary patterns and lifestyles are factors closely related to the nutritional transition and the double burden of malnutrition. Uh, given the rising rates of mal overnutrition and no communicable disease in conjunction with the current prevalence of undernutrition in Mexico, traditional approaches may not effectively address this health burden. Uh, taking a life course approach allows for the early uh, identification of risk to allow for the, uh, the, the development of nutrition and lifestyle intervention that can prevent disease. This approach is considered preventive measure before conception and during feral development, early childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and beyond. Uh, we conclude, resolving malnutrition requires navigating across many pathways and integrating intervention in multiple sectors. As a, multi a multidisciplinary approach is required to address its multiple underlying factors. Establishing com comprehensive and holistic intervention plans uh, such as uh, effective policy making consider factor in socioeconomic and cultural driver on malnutrition and applies them strategically across life stages is essential to prevent the passage of malnutrition on the future, future uh, generation. Uh, thank you. Next. Presentation outlines include background, methodology, results, conclusion, references, and acknowledgement. So the background of the study is diabetes diabetes is characterized by relative insulin insufficiency in the target organ, which caused by pancreatic beta cell malfunction and insulin resistance. Dietary carbohydrates are the main factor in influencing postprandial glucose levels. Several clinical studies have shown that diet should reduce carbohydrates and hence glycemic control. The mineral chromium is crucial for maintaining appropriate glucose function. Problem statement is there is a scarcity of data related to people's knowledge about the effectiveness of low carb diet and the use of chromium supplementation. So the aim of the study is to determine the effectiveness of low-carb diet along with chromium supplementation in treating type 2 diabetes. Moving on to our methodology, 
to the design a cross section <coughs> as well as possible the resecting the study in Jude by Wood Health Center of Lahore Lahore is a second largest metropolitan city <coughs> Pakistan study population both males and females registered in the health centers duration of study was six months November 2022 to April 2023 study instruments a self-developed questionnaire was used to collect the data and analyze the SSS version to assess. Results The response rate of the participants was 80%. Majority of the patients were of age group 41 to 50 years. The participants had a substantial proportion of females. It was shown that the majority of the patients were overweight as evidenced by a BMI between 25 kg per meter square to 29.9 kg per meter square. 4% of the patients had diabetes before initiating the treatment program, and 16% were pre-diabetic. After 3 months, it was found that 54% of the patients got ideal HbA1c level, while 39% were still in the pre-diabetic range. 45% experienced a reduction in their weight. Furthermore, it was discovered that 62% of the patients knew nothing about a low-carb diet and after the treatment, more than 40% of participants thought that low-carb diet, while 33% selected both low-carb diet and chromium supplements to be more effective in controlling sugar levels. Conclusion The available evidence concluded that low-carb diet and chromium supplements did hold good glycemic control in type 2 diabetic patients. Additionally, more studies are needed to assess the effectiveness of low-carb diet and supplementation in diabetes. Recommendations Firstly, raise awareness. <coughs> do out educational campaigns targeting healthcare professionals, individuals with type 2 diabetes, and the general public about the potential benefits of a low-carb diet and chromium supplementation <coughs> in reversing type 2 diabetes. Secondly, research funding. Government should allocate resources for research studies investigating the long-term effects and the efficacy of low-carb diet and chromium supplementation in reversing type 2 diabetes. Dietetic nutrition, functional food and vascular disease, the Faculty of Medicine of Monastery, University of Monastery in Tunisia. During storage and heat treatments, vegetable oils undergo oxidative and exolytic deterioration that depend on enhancing and esterosic factors like fatty acid composition, light, oxygen, and temperature. This deteriorative process causes serious heat and quality problems. Because of oxidation products such as alcohol, aldehyde, ketones that leading to loss in nutritional value and unacceptable property for customers. Thus, one way to improve the stability of these oils is by application of synthetic and natural antioxidants. Corn oil was widely used for cooking and considered a healthy choice to, uh, due to the balancing amount of saturated fatty acid monounsaturated fatty acid and a high content of polyunsaturated fatty acid. However, the relatively high polyunsaturated fatty acid content makes so vulnerable the term oxidative degradation leading to rancidity of flavors and discoloration, which limits its application as frame oil. Synthetic antioxidants like butylated hydroxyanisole or butylated hydroxytoluene are used to depress sensitivity of fats and oils. However, the toxicity of sensitive antioxidants and increasing consumer demand for natural products have directed our attention to more the edible plants and byproducts as resources of safer and more effective antioxidants. Grab seeds are imported processing by Brota. It has a large scale of application, being used in various fields from cosmetics to food supplements and is rich in biologically active compounds between them, hypophilic antioxidants, tocotinols, and tocopherols. Hence, this work aims to investigate the antioxidant potential of grapeseed extract on corn oil during heating at 
118 as well as to compare its antioxidant performance with that of BHT. Oxidative changes were modulated by the peroxide value, pyanidine value, free fatty acid value, conjugated DNA content, conjugated DNA content, total oxidation value, polyphenol content, as well as oil antioxidant activity. The scientific antioxidant PHT and capsid extract are 200, 500 and 1000 ppm were now added separately in corn oil in order to evaluate their antioxidant efficiency during heating under 118. The oils were thoroughly mixed and exposed to heating for 2, 4, 6 and 8 hours in order to evaluate their oxidative stability. The evolution of the oxidation state is followed by peroxide value, free fatty acid, pyanidine value, conjugated DNA and conjugated DNA, total oxidation, total polyphenol content, as well as the PPH prevention activities. Data were subjected to statistical analysis using analysis of variance technique, and differences among the means were compared using the Duncan Wichita Range test. Our result reveals that the free fatty acid contents demonstrated a gradual increase through the tinting time. It was observed that corn oil containing 201,000 ppm rapsid extract as well as 200 ppm DHT showed gradual increase in the free fatty acid of the oil samples. And there was also remarkable differences in free fatty acid trend of corn oil containing additive rapsid extract and DHT and corn oil which contain no additive. Based on the result obtained, it was clear that rapsid extract was able to retain the hydrolysis of triglycerides. No statistical differences was observed between corn oil and, uh, ad, uh, supplemented with DHT and corn oil supplemented with rapsid extract. The degree of primary oxidation of corn oil was determined by measuring peroxide value in the presence and absence of antioxidant during heating process. A continuous increase in peroxide value with increase in heating time was observed for all samples. After 8 hours of heating, the peroxide value of corn oil with no additive increased by 2 times. Our result reveals also, at any heating time, the peroxide value measured in supplemented sample containing Perhaps extract or BHT were significantly, were significantly lower than those of corn oil with no additive. In addition, the peroxide value for their samples increased, but its increase was very slow, which may indicate good antioxidant capacity due to the addition of perhaps extract or BHT. Conjugated DNA and conjugated DNA are generated by the oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids, as shown in Fig 3. The continuous increase in conjugated gen with the increase of heating time was observed for all samples. At any time of heating, the conjugated gen measured in corn oil with no additive were significantly higher than those of the sample containing trapsid extract. Significant differences were also observed between corn oil with uh, supplemented with BHT and corn oil supplemented with trapsid extract only after 6 and 8 hours of heating. As observed for conjugated gene, the continuous increase in conjugated gene with the increase of heating time was observed for all samples. At any heating time, the conjugated gene measured in corn oil were significantly lower than those of, super, of the supplement samples containing grapeseed extract or DHT. No significant differences were observed between two samples. Pen-seeding value is a reliable measurement of the amount of secondary oxidation products which were formed by the decomposition of primary oxidation ones. As can be seen, the pen-seeding value of all oil samples significantly increases as a function of heating time. In addition, our result revealed that at any heating period, statistical analysis revealed that the pen-seeding value of corn oil with no additive were significantly lower than those of the supplemented oils. This rapid increase in PNDT value indicated the, indicates the repeat duration of oils. 
Significantly, differences were only observed between corn oil supplemented with DHT and corn oil supplemented with rapid extract, mainly at levels of 1000 ppm. The total oxidation of the oil samples can be determined based on the calculated peroxide value and PNSD values. The top values measure primary and secondary oxidation products reflecting the initial and later stage of the oil oxidation. As indicated in Fig. 6, the detox value demonstrates a gradual increase through the heating time. As a comparison among the samples, the total increase of detox value during the heating time were in order of corn oil at 1000 ppm, followed by corn oil at 500 ppm, followed by corn oil at 200 ppm, followed by corn oil uh, supplemented with DHT, followed by corn oil with no additive. Based on this result obtained, it was clear that addition of rapid extract on, on corn oil are able to retard oil oxidation better than DHT. The initial final content in corn oil supplemented with grapeseed extract at 200, 500, and 1000 ppm was significantly higher than that in the corn oil with no additive. With the increase in heating time, the total polyphenol content of all oils decreases significantly as a function of time. After each heating time, a significant difference was observed among the different oils, which are classified according to their phenolic content as follows corn oil at uh, 1000 ppm, followed by corn oil at uh, 500 ppm, followed by corn oil at 200 ppm, followed by corn oil at supplemented with DHT followed by corn oil with no additive. The corn oil with no additive had the lowest phenol content. The difference in the remaining contents observed in phenol did not reflect resistance to phenol degradation. The study of the PPR scavenging ability of all samples revealed that initially supplemented oils have higher radical scavenging activity compared to corn oil with no additive. Then, the DPPH radical scavenging activity of different samples studied significantly decreases as a function of heating time. All supplemented with the grapeseed extract at different concentrations show high radical scavenging ability than those with DHT at each heating period studied. In conclusion, our result revealed that grapeseed extract had little antioxidant activity against oxidative deterioration of corn oil during heating at 118. Also, the antioxidant activity of grapeseed extract against oxidative degradation of corn oil was better than that of BHG, mainly at level of 1000 ppm. Further studies can be done using this extract on other edible oil during heating or storage to improve their oxidative stability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Citrus fruits and all their products have been part of the daily human intake in one or the other forms all over the world, hence are recognized as important components in human health. A side source of income to the growers, citrus also provides raw materials to the citrus-based industries and has nutritive medicinal values and a source of prosperity. Over the past few years, food safety has become and continues to be the number one concern of the fresh produce industries. To consumers, appearance quality is most important that they are also keenly interested in their firmness and long shelf life. Methods of harvesting that is hand vis-a-vis -vis mechanical 
can significantly have impacts on the composition. Objectives of the study. One is to identify the post-service treatment mostly used by the citrus farmers. The post-service treatment here, we're talking about a situation where this, the fruits, harvested fruits are covered and then other ones are also left at the basis of the direct sunlight. Objective two, to determine whether the post-service treatment have effects on the food quality characteristics. Methodology, laboratory analysis. The laboratory design was structured to determine the effect of post-survey treatment that is covering and uncovering of the fruits after harvesting on the citrus fruit quality characteristics. The parameters assessed were the fruit weight, fruit diameter, diameters, juice volume, juice content, vitamin C, pH value, total tetratable acidity, that is TTA, total soluble solid, TSS, and then the shelf life. Materials, 10 uh, fresh fruits, each at similar maturity stages and sizes were randomly selected from each of the two districts for the experiment. The experiment was, the materials, was, um, materials were taken from two different districts in the central region of Ghana. With regard to post harvest treatment, that is covering and uncovering of the fruits after harvesting were analyzed in all 140 citrus fruits were selected for the post survey treatment. 10 fruits were used for the laboratory analysis for each treatment. Now, the results of the post survey treatment mostly used by the farmers, as said earlier on. Um, the, the situation has been that after harvesting or before the fruits, the fresh fruits are transported to their various destinations. Some are left in the direct sun, others are also uh, covered. So upon the survey conducted in the two districts, it was um, realized that the 9% of the, the fruit harvested are uncovered, that they are left to the mercies of the direct sunlight. And you have 91% of them being covered. Now it's come to um, storage conditions of citrus fruits. The conditions we have the those that are left in the sun, those that are refrigerated, and those that are kept under sheet, and those that are stored at the room temperature. So from the result, it was realized that 54% of the fruits are kept in the sun. Those that are put in the refrigerator or refrigerators, you have 2.1%. And those fruits that are kept under shade after harvesting or during storage, that's 21.1. And then those that are stored at the room temperature, also given 21.8%. Now, on the um, issue of the effect of the post survey treatment on fruit weights and then fruit uh, diameter. This was conducted over a period of uh, four weeks, uh, 28 days. And after the 28 days, you have the, the fruit weight, fruit weight and then the fruit diameter. Looking at the fruit that were covered, the, the weight decrease from um, decrease at week two, week three, and week four. Same applies to the those that were uncovered. But looking at the two, you could realize that the the rate at which the food weight reduced was higher in those that were exposed to direct sunlight. Looking at the diameter as well with the diameter uh, under covered, covered uh, fruits. Week two, there was sharp reduction. It continues to week three and week four as well. When look at the fruit that were left uncovered, 
Also, there was reduction in the second week, third week, and the fourth week. But in all this, when we compare the two, the rate at the, which the, the diameter diminished was high in the uncovered fruits as against the covered ones. Then we also look at the, the juice weight, the effect of uh, post harvest treatment on juice weight and juice content, that is percentage. Also with the covered one, there was uh, over the period of four weeks or 28 days, there was slight uh, reduction, slight reduction from week one up to week, um, week four. With the uncovered, also there was reduction, but the rate at which the reduction was taking place was um, comparatively higher than those uh, that were covered. Uh, when it comes to the juice content as well, over a period of 28 uh, days, looking at the uncovered, though there was some, uh, the second week, at the second week there was some slight uh, increase in the juice uh, contents in terms of percentage. And the, the third week it reduced and then it rose again. Looking at the food that were uncovered, there was sharp decline in the juice content second week, third week, then it started going up gradually at the end of the fourth week. Then also we look at the effect of post harvest treatment on the quality and food quality characteristics. Here we looked at the, the quality index, we considered food weight, food diameter, and food content for both the covered fruit and then the uncovered fruit. At the end of the 28 days period, it was realized that the, uh, the fruit weight has reduced, uh, fruit weight for uncovered fruit uh, reduced by 10.67% as against 7.70 for the covered fruits. With the diameter, there was a reduction of 12.53 against 9.46 for the uncovered and covered respectively. Looking at the um, fruit juice content of the same period, there was 15.60% reduction for uncovered and then 10.60% for the covered fruit. Then still on the vitamin C, the effects on vitamin C and pH for both the covered and, and uncovered. Looking at the trend with vitamin C, first with the covered fruits, uh, there was a sharp decline at the second week. Then it rose again sharply at the third week. And there's another um, increase at the week four, but at very slow uh, pace. Then coming to the, uh, the food that were uncovered, this one gave the, the reverse. There was sharp increase in vitamin C content in the second week, then it dropped slightly at the third week, and then it rose again. But looking at the, the pH of the fruits that were uh, covered, that were, that were covered. First, second week, there was a rise in the pH uh, level. Then that, that level was maintained in the third week. And then the fourth week, it rose again at the end of the fourth week. But with the fruit that were uncovered, that were left in the direct sun, that one didn't have any change from week one up to week eight, or over the period of uh, 28 days, the pH value still remained the same, which means there wasn't any effect on the whether the fruit will be covered or the fruit will be left in the direct sunlight. Then we also look at the um, TTA and then TSS. 
the total tetritable acidity, and then the total soluble solid, that the degree breaks. With the covered food, first, there was reduction in the second week. The third week, it rose again that there was uh, increase. And then at the end of the fourth week, there was another uh, reduction. But looking at the uncovered uh, fruit, there's a sharp increase at the end of the second week. Then it increased again, but here, the rate at which it was increasing uh, was, wasn't that much. And the content once again reduced at the end of the fourth week, that the 28 days. And then with the, um, the degree bricks, that the total soluble solids, with the covered fruits, there was an increase in the second week. And the third week, there was sharp drop, or sharp drop. And then on the fourth week, it increased again. Looking at the uncovered, the result indicates that there was a, an increase um, in the degree bridge at the end of the second week. The third week, it's, it's dropped slight, slightly and then rose again to the same value as we observed in the second week. Result continued. Now, Table three, looking at the effect of post-service treatment on the shelf life of the citrus fruit stored at a room temperature for a period of 21 days. So we have treatment, we have total sample, we have week one, week two, week three, week four. Total spoilage, total sample left, and then percentage spoilage. So from the treatment section, we have the covered fruits and then uncovered fruits. Uh, 20 uh, fruits randomly selected were used for um, each treatment that are covered and then the uncovered. Looking at the, the, the outcome, week one, there was uh, one loss, that's one got spot with two, three, week, um, three, one, week four, one. So we have total spoilage of six, that fruit, uh, six fruits got a spot. Percentage-wise, at the end of the 28 days, it was realized that fruits that were covered uh, had a loss of, uh, or total spoilage of 30%. Then looking at the uncovered fruits, we have the first week, two of them got spoiled, second week, three, fourth week, uh, one, and then a third week, one, and a fourth week, we have uh, three, totaling and nine. And this nine represents 45% of the spoilage. So we have 30% spoilage of the covered fruit against 45% of the uncovered fruits. The implications. The results indicate that holding citrus fruit for up to 20 days could reduce fruit quality in both treatments, but relatively, quality is more adversely affected when fruits are exposed to direct sunlight. Nutritionally, citrus fruit, whether covered or uncovered, when cared for 20 days, although decreased in weight, Juice content and size, that in terms of diameter, it still contains some appreciable quantities of vitamin C, as well as um, soluble sugars, which are also um, which are used as good source of nutrition for the body. The general inconsistencies of vitamin C content, total tetratable acidity and total soluble solid were due to the temperature fluctuations because the, there, was, uh, there were some fluctuations um, that were observed during the period and the consideration. And this was uh, also found by Brooks et al. in 2019. 
An increase in ascorbic acid is good for companies' secondary production because some companies purchase the fruits according to the content of the ascorbic acid, which determines the sugar level. Exposure to sunlight, heat, and pH allow ascorbic acid reverse as ascorbic acid reversing oxidized into dehydroascorbic acid, that is DHA. And later, the DHA will also irreversibly hydrolyze to form 2,3-diketoglonic acid. That is according to Yin et al. 2022. According to C. Pada et al. 19, 93, vitamin C content decrease with time of maturity and prolong storage citral life, citral fruits. The content of vitamin C in fruits is influenced by factors such as genotypic differences, pre-harvest and post-harvest climatic conditions and cultural practices, maturity and harvesting methods and post-harvest handling procedures. Conclusion. Fresh fruits, as uh, we all know now, as it is known, play a significant role in human nutrition, especially as a source of vitamins, minerals, and dietary fiber. The quality, the degree of excellence or superiority is a combination of attributes, properties, or characteristics that give each commodity value in terms of its intended use. However, from the findings, whether the fruits are covered or exposed to sun, uh, sunlight, that is after they have they've been harvested, they all affect all these two treatments, all affect the fruit quality. However, it was observed that leaving the fruit in the sun has more adverse effects on the fruit quality characters, such as juice content, fruit weight, vitamin C, total tractable acidity, and total soluble solid, that degree breaks. It is therefore recommended that farmers and other stakeholders cover their fruits after harvest to forestall some of these challenges. Thank you for the end of presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Those are open for any further uh, questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's a beautiful presentation. If anyone has any questions, please ask. It is important for health care professionals to know the degree of malnutrition in patients, how and when to intervene, these questions were the starting point for this work. We are Portuguese nurses. We work in adult intermediate care unity. We care for critical patients from different clinical specialties, mostly elderly patients with chronic disease in acute exacerbation. This required a high degree of differentiation of care and intensive interventions. Patient nutrition always been a priority in nurse daily care. There was no risk assessment in, implemented in my health unity. Therefore, in the year of 20, 2017, uh, the nutrition risk assessment scale, NRS 2002, was implemented in the UC for screen and identify at the time of admission, the degree of nutritional risk of admitted patients. This is, was our poster that we show now. And then we start to the high prevalence of malnutrition in hospitalized patient is strongly documented. Different studies related hospital malnutrition with an increase of frequency of clinical complications, high mortality, increased plans of hospitalization and the consequent impact on costs. 
the nutritional assessment of the critical ill patient is a multidisciplinary screening process which aims to implant a personalized care plan. The object of our work was to know the most frequently uh, nutrition risk score sign in the initial nutrition risk assessment to patients admitted in the UC in the year of 2021 to identify and uh, characterize the patients with an initial nutritional risk assessment in the UC in the year 2021 to know the predominant discriminator in the initial nutrition risk assessment of patients admitted in the UC in the year 2021, to relate the nutrition risk score with the patient age, clinical typology, days of hospitalization and use, and the use of artificial nutrition in the UC in the year 2021. Our methodology was a retrospective analysis of nursing records to all patients admitted in the DUC with initial assessment of nutritional risk from the 1 of January of the year 21, 2021 to 31 of December of the year 2021 using the computerized registration S clinic. A nutritional risk evaluation, NRS 2002, is a tool that assessment tool that allows early detection of malnutrition patients and or at risk of malnutrition in hospital environments. Assess the patient at two different times. First, the initial assessment carried by the nurses is in the first 24 hours of patient admit, uh, admission. Final assessment made or carried by the nutritionist 48 hours after the patient admissions. The, the advantage of this tool is a practical tool, safe, quick and cost-free. It allows to the healthcare team assess, identify and intervene quickly in the patient's therapeutic process. So our sample was all the patients we start with all the patients admitted in the year of 2021. So in the year 2021, we admitted 1,169 patients in the UC. 426 patients of the, uh, admitted in the UC have no nutritional screening. And 743 patients admitted on the UC have a nutritional screening. This is our uh, sample, the 743 patients. The, we decide to make a characterization of the sample in gender. And we can see by the, the graphic that 58% uh, point, 28% of uh, the patients were men and 41% were women. And we know that the mean age of patients at nutrition risk was 60 years old. Then uh, we want to know in the, uh, of this age of the patients, the interval between the ages. So as we can see, 46% of the patients in the sample have more than 66 years and less than eight years old. And it was very uh, curiously that we have 5% of patients with more than uh, 81 years and less than 100 years. After uh, we try to know the clinical typology of the patients of the sample, as we can see, 64% uh, of the patients were medical patients, 34% were surgical patients, and 0.9% uh, were obstetrical patients. We know that to also know that overage days of hospitalization in UC was four days for these patients, and the overage days of hospitalizations in hospital was 18 days. The initial nutritional risk assessment, we want to know of the sample, how many uh, patients had uh, risk, some kind of risk after the, the nurses used the tool of uh, initial nutrition risk assessment. And we can see that 91% of the patients have some kind of risk and only 8% of the patients have no risk of uh, nutritional. 
After that, we want to know the prevalence of the score, of the risk score uh, in the uh, sample uh, of the patients that we are using. As we can see here, 61% of the patients have a risk score one, and 23% uh, of patients of the sample have a risk score two. We can see too that only 0.4 uh, patients have the highest risk uh, scored for. After that, we want to know which was the discriminator that uh, nurses identify in the uh, initial screening uh, tool. As we can see here too, the most used discriminator was uh, the uh, serious heel of the patients, the uh, uh, intensive care, 62% of the patients uh, was in these situations. And the second one, the second discrimination more used was the uh, reduce of food intake in the last week. 46% of the patients has this discrimination. After that, we want to uh, cross the data with risk, uh, score, uh, risk score and clinical typology. As we can see here too, the medical patients have more risks than the other, the surgical patients. But as we can see here, both of them stays in the score one and in score two. After we cross the risk score with clinical typology and age, as we can see, both of uh, typical uh, typology uh, patients uh, surgical and medical uh, have more patients in the score one or two, but patients with more than 60 years old have more risk than the others. Then we want to know the, how, we, how was the, util, the administration of artificial nutrition in the patients of the sample. So as you can see in this graphic, 276 patients were nutritional supplements and 123 patients was uh, administrated parenteral nutrition and 70 patients were administrated with uh, enteral nutrition. After that, we can see that in the score of risk one and score of risk, uh, risk score one and risk score two, of uh, nutrition, we can see that where the most um, patients was using nutritional supplements. But we can see here that parental nutrition was used too on the uh, patients with uh, risk score one and in risk score two. Then we cross the artificial nutrition with clinical typology and the age of the patients from the sample. As we can see in this graphic, the age, it's a very important factor because we can see that patients with more than 65 years old are, uh, were the most supplemented with um, nutritional supplements and they were almost the same for medical and uh, surgical patients. Then we cross and we want to know the overage hospitalization days uh, related with clinical typology. As we can see, uh, the overage of hospitalization days in intermediate care was for surgical and for medical uh, patients, three days for surgical patients and 4.15 uh, days for medical patients. But when we look for the graphic and we can see that medical patients stay more time in hospital than the surgical patients. Medical patients stay 20 days, 0.11 in hospital. Uh, in hospital. Our results, we can say that of the 1,169 1 patients that were admitted in the UC, 63% had an initial nutritional risk assessment carried by the nurses in the first 24 hours. 58.2 of the patients are men and 41.7 were women with an overage of 60 years old. 
Regarding clinic typology, 35 of the patients were surgical and 64 medical and 1% was obstetric patients. Of the 743 patients, the, our sample, with initial risk assessment, 8.8 .8 had no nutrition risk. 85.1 patients, percent of the patients with nutritional risk, we can say that 61.5 were score one and 23% were on score two. This was the most prevalent scores in the unity, score one of risk and score two. The two discrimination most used by nurses in the initial nutrition risk assessment were is the patient serious heal and the reduction in food intake in the last week. By relating the nutritional risk score with the clinical typology and the age of the patients, we found that 25.9% 25 .9 of the patients have a risk score of one and the majority, 38.7, are medical typology and over more than over 60 years old. When analyzing the relationship between the clinical typology and the overage number of days in UC stay, with overage number of days in hospital stay, we could that we couldn't that patient stays an overage of four days in UC and 18 days in hospital. Comparatively, medical patients remained hospitalized for 20 days and surgical patients for 70 days. Regarding artificial nutrition, 30.6% of the patient with a risk score, one, and 19.1% of the patients with a risk score, two, used nutritional supplements. Intral nutrition was administrated to 7.7% of the patients and the total, of the total parental nutrition to 8.8% .8 of the patients of the sample. Finally, it was found that patients aged over six years admitted in the UC were the most supplemented regardless of the clinical typology. Conclusions. We can say that most of the patients admitted in the UC have some type of, of nutritional risk. The most prevalent nutrition risk score in this sample is the risk score one and two. It also shows that early identification of patients with nutrition risk in hospital settings carried by the nurses in the first 24 hours after patient admission, we believe that has a significant and relevant impact through the nutritional therapeutic strategy for the patient reduce, reducing the risk of malnutrition in hospital settings. It's important to encourage and train the teams to understand the importance of assessing the nutritional risk of the patients admitted in hospitals, contributing for 100% of assessment rates. It's important to evaluate the relationship between the use of artificial nutrition and real method, metabolic needs of the patients and reflect on the importance of artificial nutrition in the development of new knowledge to combat malnutrition in healthcare. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, please do it. Thank you, Luisa, for the presentation. Yes, you may ask the question if you want to ask. 